on behalf of the Victorian Historical Society, uh, welcome Alex Konechny, um, the 15 champions of the war reenactors, and talk about the day in the life of a Civil War soldier. Well, welcome, thank you all for coming today. Um, so, actually, I do a Civil War presentation for eighth graders. Most of you are a little older than that, so I'll scale up for you guys. We weren't sure what the age count about today was. Um, but I do like to start usually by before I get into kind of the life of a soldier, what they went through, with just a little backstory, because that really helps inform what the soldiers themselves are kind of thinking when they get into this whole mess in the first place, right? So, November 6, 1860, Lincoln is elected president of the United States, Saddam is off with less than 50% of the vote. It's like 40%. Does that happen? Well, there are a bunch of other guys running too, so Lincoln's not even the first choice. But a month later, December 20th, South Carolina, and here are what they claim are their states' rights, and there's a whole conversation to be had about what exactly that means. Um, but they decide the federal government's not serving their needs, and they're out of here. So they're going to secede from the Over the next four months, another nine states or so are also going to leave. It's basically, the entire deep south, right along the coastline, are all going to say, I'm out of here. We're done. We're not going to be part of the Union anymore. Then you get to mid-April, well, Confederate forces in the harbor of Charleston are going to open fire on the federally held Fort Sumter, right there in the middle of the harbor. Um, it's just a little floating fortress, right? In the Civil War begins. First shots were fired at that time. Uh, interestingly, one of the bloodiest, or the bloodiest conflict in American history begins without a single in-battle casualty, when a cannon blows up and injures somebody at the end. But otherwise, nobody dies during this. Uh, of course, that's going to change very rapidly. Uh, but the war has begun. Two days later, Lincoln calls for aid. He says, I need soldiers to fight for this war. Uh, this is clearly going to take some effort. We're going to bring the South back into the Union. These are rebellious states. We're going to bring them back. So he calls up for aid. He calls up for 90,000 troops to serve for three months. Now, that does not sound like enough men or enough time. Because it isn't, but that's literally all that he can call up. He can call up 90,000 men for three months because our, almost our entire military at that time are militia. The state militia. There's like a standing army of like 10,000 people. It's very small and a lot are going to lose the Confederacy. So Lincoln says, we need militias to come up and serve and fight this army. So he calls for aid. And as soon as he does that, four more states, Virginia among them, say, I'm not going to fight against my southern brother. We didn't want to leave, but now you forced our hand out of here. They're also so Lincoln's kind of concerned at this point, uh, as you might understand. He's asking for help, and states are still leaving the Union entirely. So fortunately for him, thank you, uh, Michigan is going to answer the call. The rest of the northern states that remain will, of course, do so also, but Michigan is actually one of the first states to send troops. He's going to call up four regiments of uh, infantry to serve from Michigan. Michigan says, oh, we can do better than that. They sent seven. <laughs> So Michigan is now state at this time. We joined the Union in 1837. So there are people who still remember before Michigan was, you know, a state. They're pretty proud of this new country they're a part of. So there's a really good response. So May 15th, 1st Michigan, volunteer infantry, march into Washington. And Lincoln says to one of the aides standing nearby, he goes, what men are those? He says, well, those boys are from Michigan, sir. He famously says, thank God for Michigan. He didn't know if anyone was going to be sending help. Michigan did, though. Good for us. Over the course of the war, Michigan's actually going to send about 90,000 men, which is about a quarter of the male population. A lot of other states sent more, but we sent one of the largest proportionately. Um, about 14,000 men are not going to come. Which is, again, one of the higher rates of casualties, unfortunately. Now, that all being said, nobody knew that at the time. So, a bunch of bright-eyed young farm boys say, hey, this sounds like fun. I'm going to go join the army. Uh, when you think about it, most of these guys have never been away from home hardly most of their life. You've got, uh, you're going to be born, live, get married, raise your kids, and die within a 20 mile radius, unless you're going to end up moving to a different state, which did happen a fair bit coming to Michigan anyway. So these guys think, well, this is great. I'm going to get to go, I'm going to see the world a little bit, get to travel the country, get a snazzy uniform, get 
great meals in the army. Everyone knows there's good food in the army, right? <laughs> they did the nerd checks. Um, and, you know, um, you know, beautiful, looking good. This is going to be a fun time. And they, the war's going to be over by Christmas, right? So he's asking for about three months. It's nothing. I can do that. So they start signing up. Now, as a private in Mr. Lincoln's Army of the Potomac, which is one of the federal armies, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. Your first stuff you're going to get is usually issued by the state you're from, but after a while, the federal government steps in and starts giving you your equipment. So, you'll receive the following. One, snazzy frock coat, as I'm wearing today. Uh, you don't get the diamond down there unless you're really smart. <laughs> or in my case, somebody talked you into it, and you end up doing more work. Um, <laughs> one pair of snazzy, baggy, diaper butt mold trousers. And then sagging behind, which is a plus because this covers it. You're also going to be receiving, hopefully, one five pound wool blanket without leaves on it, hopefully. You might have to bring your own wool blanket. Turns out something about thousands and thousands of people all needing a new blanket all at once to take off the war, it kind of started to run out. Who knew? Look at one of these, about five pounds and not real thick. Surprisingly warm. You're also going to get a knapsack. This is what's called a duffel bag knapsack. It has two compartments. Depending on who you talk to, you put one, you know, stuff in one and stuff in the other. I personally like to put my blanket down the bottom one and all my little stuff on the bottom. A lot of different ways to pack it. It's entirely up to you. Just don't bring too much stuff. A lot of guys made that mistake right off the bat. Their mom sent them out of, you know, away from home with, oh, here's some cookies, and here's a bunch of extra stuff, and here's two or three of these, and some extra hankies, and oh, you're going to want this from your aunt, and, you know, writing kits, and you can write. <coughs> They got loaded up with stuff and they're walking around like this. A lot of stuff will get left by the highway as they're marching. You are also going to receive your house. I know, houses have gotten a little bigger since then. This mobile, mobile house. <laughs> First mobile home. Uh, it's up there. This is what's called a, she a shelter tent or a tent de abri is the French word for it. Uh, this guy named McClellan turns out to be a fairly useless general, all things considered. Um, I'll get to him. <laughs> um, before the war, he travels over to Crimea. There's a war going on there. War watching was popular. You watched what other countries were doing so you didn't make the same mistakes. Hopefully. And he saw the French were using these. The premise is basically it's a big cotton sheet. Uh, it's got buttons on three sides and they button together. Each man will carry one of these, and then when you're, get, you're going for the evening, you will button the halves together along the top side here. You'll get a couple of sticks, and you'll make kind of a little, you know, sort of a teepee style thing up front here. And that is what you're going to sleep on. Now, I can't set this up in here for you guys to see, because it would be frowned upon to drive stakes into the floor. <laughs> but, I'm going to be laying in it, kind of going this way, now, I'm not real tall. I'm actually about the average size of a Civil War soldier. Okay. Is there a flaw with this? <laughs> yes, rather. Um, I like to ask the kids who are uh, when I'm doing this presentation for them, which end is going to stick out, your head or your feet? And there's no good answer to that question, because either way you're going to get rained on and things like that. Now, you can scrunch up and kind of spoon with your buddy, which was very popular at the time, keeps you nice and warm. Um, but that being said, as soon as you stretch out, you will get rained on. I know from experience. Now, the reason that people often were carrying these was that this is something portable. This weighs all of maybe a pound. The other tents at the time have to be carried in wagons. So they think, well, hey, each man carries one of these. You find a couple of sticks when you get where you're going. And now we have a portable shelter to keep the men out of the rain, sort of. Um, a lot of the veterans would tell you at the time that uh, they're okay keeping off of just a light drizzle, but anything more than that, and they leak like a suit. I find especially right around the buttons. Anyway, look at one of those. Works better as a top layer of your blanket than anything else. You're also going to get some other very stylish wool clothing. Almost everything that the government's going to give you that touches your body is made out of wool with one exception. And it's not the shirt. You'll be wearing this very stylish, well-worn, <laughs> it's called Federal Issue, Donut flannel wool shirt. 
Insufferable hair shirts is the phrase that I've heard used to describe it in the period. They are very itchy, they're not very comfortable, and they shrink up a lot. They have one button at the top and nothing else. I will say it's a hot day, you can stick your fingers in there and let a little breeze in, it's very comfortable. Of course, you're still wearing a wool shirt, so that's relevant. The only thing that isn't wool that will touch you is your stylish drawers. <laughs> so, the initial thought is it's kind of like long underwear, which is true. Um, more so, their job, though, is to both protect your legs from the scratchiness of your wool trousers, but also, yeah, and they are scratchy. Because um, remember, there's no other underwear. This is pretty much what you get for underwear. Um, but also, they <coughs> to protect your clothing from, well, you. Uh, oils and the sweat and the things like that on your body uh, leach into your clothing just like they do now, except it's all wool, and I think anyone who's accidentally put a sweater in the dryer will tell you that wool does not wash very well. I have a couple of sweaters about this big. <laughs> so, so do you? Yes. yes. I think everybody's probably done it at least once, and uh, when you're talking about basically boiling your clothes to get them clean and then putting them out in the hot sun to dry, you rather they have a very small shirt or trousers or whatever you've got left, right? Alright. You're also going to get one of these. This is called a sack coat. Now, we have two, or a fatigue blouse, so let's get a phrase over here. I have two coats that I can be wearing right now. This one is your 1858 dress coat. This is the one you wear for special, uh, special occasions. This is your, your kind of your dress A, I think is the modern military term, more or less. Um, there was a problem with these. The guys didn't like them for a couple of reasons. One, they're quite fitted, and they're a little snug uh, when they fit properly. Also, they're kind of like wearing a wool quilt. There are layers of padding in the chest that make your chest look, you know, okay. It doesn't work on me, but you know, other people. <laughs> it's a popular thing to do at the time. People had padding in their chests to give us kind of a robin breasted look. Makes you look kind of puffy and strong. Um, but that also means you're wearing a wool quilt. Very toasty, not very popular. A lot of guys would end up just using this. This one was meant for the grubby jobs. When you're building roads, cutting down trees, digging wagons out of the mud in the road, things like that. That's what this is for. You guys kind of prefer these anyway. They're light, they're airy, they're comfortable, they move. So they just got rid of these entirely, mostly one of those. There are lots of exceptions. You'll see some going by on this one too. Alright, so that's most of our clothing. Oh. Wait, no it's not. You're also going to get wool socks, of course, and very stylish footwear. Now, these are called brogans. They look more or less like a regular shoe now, but they are held together with either little wooden pegs and the sole. It's kind of hard for you guys to see back there, I apologize. Um, or they are sewn, which is a plus. They're not very comfortable. They're sometimes made on what's called a straight last, which means there's no right and no left. You will wear them through the mud and the rain, and other things that make mud on the roads following after horses. Um, and they will start to form to your feet. Sort of. They're still not. That's your choice of footwear, though. Some guys will also wear tall boots. You come up to about mid calf uh, Problem with those, I can tell you a buddy of mine wore one when we hiked up a mountain for an event uh, last year. And he had just the worst blisters. He says they're hot, they're heavy, they don't breathe very well. A lot of guys wore them anyway. A lot of guys prefer to go with the little, what's called the Jefferson booty, is the other phrase you'll hear. Made popular by uh, about to be President Jefferson at the time for his inaugural address. Their shoes with laces, they were revolutionary at that time. All right, well, that's most of our stuff here. You got also head here, though, right? I'm wearing what's called a forest cap or the team cap. Very stylish, also. Modeled on what's called a uh, shake out. So, Previous wars, Mexican War, and things like that. But they wear very tall hats like this. And the purpose was mostly to make you look tall and intimidating. Not sure anyone was fooled, but that was the thing, right? Guys discovered, though, that you walk through low doorways and through trees and stuff like that, and the tendency is for these to get kind of knocked off and they're tippy and they're in the way. So they would take the supports out of them and they would flop like this. Well, eventually they just stopped putting supports in to begin with, and they'd be issued like this. You will hear some people tell you that they're called a forage cap, because you can loosen up the chin strap here, and 
kind of, you know, tuck it through there. There we go. Now I've got a bucket to carry my forage in. Oh. <laughs> Question everything else that person's about to tell you. Um, this is held together with thread right there. A little, little bit of sewing just to hold that button on. That's not going to hold a lot of weight. And this is something you wear on your head. You don't want it full of bacon, grease, and berry juice. <laughs> Now, forage is what we refer to as a fatigue duty, a grubby job. One of the times you wear one of the, the kind of soft and flexible coat. This is also the hat you'd wear for that occasion. For a fancy one, like I'm wearing right now, you get one of these. This is called either a hardy hat, sort of colloquially, or more often it's the 1858 dress hat. Um, picked up by a General Hardy who went and became a uh, Grabber's Rebel, and they were wearing these in the Netherlands, the cavalry wars, like that. It would be pinned up on the side. You might have a fancy hat cord, light blue for infantry in my case, and often have old badges and things on the front to say which regiment you were part of, things like that. So, you would look kind of like this. Guys didn't care for them. They thought that made them look like pilgrims, which is true. <laughs> that being said, it does you know, keep the sun off pretty well. It's a nice wide brim. Uh, you'll see a lot of photos of guys wearing them like this. We say it's undressed, which means it doesn't have brass letters on the front or any numbers. It doesn't have pins or anything like that or the cord even. It would just wear it like this. And that even got kind of tiresome after a while, but it still looks silly. So a lot of people, especially if you were fighting in the Western theater, would switch over to one of these. This what we call a civilian slouch hat. And it is by far my preferred hat also, unless it's only this is literally just a civilian hat that would have been very popular in the time. You'll see a couple of these guys are wearing uh, more casual hats also. There's one going by us a little later with the, uh, uh, they're all kind of charging from the side. You can see kind of a similar hat style of those guys wearing. Uh, <coughs> this is a functional hat. This keeps the sun off. This keeps the rain off. Uh, unlike this, which keeps the, um, it does, um, it's, um, it covers up your hat hair, that's what it does. That's about all it's got going for it. They're a terrible hat. The sun doesn't stay out of your eyes. The rain drips down your neck. They're kind of hot because it's wool and it's lined. They're not a great hat. But there you go. It's a uniform you have to wear, right? All right, well, that gets us through pretty much all the stuff you're going to be given. Um, you might also get one of these. It's gray coats. Uh, these are going to be kind of as weather is appropriate. I know a lot of guys who actually just wear these as their winter coat. <laughs> They're very warm. They're also extremely heavy. They're about four or five pounds. Um, not something you want to carry on your knapsack. A lot of guys actually didn't even want to carry the knapsack at all. The straps will cut into your shoulders. It's kind of uncomfortable. They switch over. So what's called a blanket roll. The idea is you take a blanket, lay it out flat. You put a couple of things in it, like your shirt, extra pair of drawers, things like that. And then you just sort of tuck it up over your body like that. And you always want it on your left shoulder. Guess as to why? You're going to shoot off the right shoulder. Yep. So if I grab my rifle, it does not obstruct my rifle at all. Now that being said, I think these are really hot, they're scratchy, you have a blanket right next to your face. I don't like it. You can't carry very much either. I personally prefer the knapsack, but that's just me. During the period, you saw a lot of guys go one way, a lot of guys go another. You technically did have to take care of your knapsack even if you were going to carry the blanket roll, because if you were issued it, you were expected to have it, and if you didn't have it when there was an inspection, guess who's paying for a new one? You are. All that stuff needed to be accounted for whether you were actively going to use it or not. Cool. So, we've got the list of things that are clothing-wise. You get some other equipment. I have, for example, my the deadliest thing that I will carry. Can't Why is it the deadliest? War metal. Nope. Kills more people than all of the bullets, bombs, bayonets, and other horrible things that the war has done. Where you go on your canteen? It's in rivers, it's in streams. Uh, when I like to gross out children, I say, let's say you're walking along, it's time to fill up your canteen, there's a river nearby, and there you go, fill it up in the river, and we're all set. But what you don't realize is that half a mile upstream, <laughs> the cavalry just passed. 
you know, men on horses? Oh. What do animals, people included, do when they step into cold water? Right? And now you're filling up your canteen with that. Um, there's an account in the, uh, by Harmon Camburn of the second Michigan, I believe it was, uh, might have been in Rice Bowls, 123rd New York, but either way. Um, they made camp where another regiment had camped a few weeks before. And they start filling up their canteen in the river that's right there. But they had a pretty sweet spot, river nearby, shade spot, filling up their canteens. They didn't realize was that the other regiment that had camped there had put their latrine, the toilet, too close to the river. Mm -hmm. Leaks down to the water table, poison the water, a lot, a lot of guys got sick. Very common. You've got a bunch of young men, mostly, who were away from home for the first time in their lives. They've never had to survive out in this kind of environment before. You, know, you think, yeah, a lot of them are farm boys, but how often do you have to date and recruit? Not very often. Uh, so they're not eating well. They're not drinking well. They're not taking good care of themselves. They're sleeping in a questionable tent, at best. Yet, a lot of them are going to get sick. Disease will account for two-thirds of the deaths in the Civil War. Two-thirds. Of a war that claimed at least probably 670,000 lives. The number will vary, depends who you talk to. Um, if you account for, you know, a guy got shot and died six months later from an infected wound, does he count as a casualty? Yes, he does. Was it counted? No, he wasn't. Um, he asked the right person, they'll say as high as over 700,000 people, two thirds of whom will die from an insect stop or diarrhea or dysentery, or <laughs> lots of horrible ways to die from illnesses. Um, also, of course, battlefield injuries are going to be very poorly patched up and often will be infected. They didn't know about sterilization. <coughs> Good news. Okay, so you got all your stuff, and you're going off to fight. It's exciting. Um, you're not going to do a lot of fighting. As a rule, most of the time, a soldier's life is going to be spent on the march. That means you're going from one place to another, often on foot, although trains are becoming a very popular way to move men around the country. Uh, you'll see a number of times when you'll get just a whole army will load up onto a series of trains and they will take by the train to where they need to go. It's a revolutionary new idea. It's never really been done before. Works pretty well though. But most of you are walking. Your average soldier can put on at least 20 to 25 miles a day. There was um, a number of occasions where Stonewall Jackson, a uh, Confederate general, but we'll forget from that because he forced his men to march over 30 miles a day in some cases. Now I know people who don't want to walk half a mile down the street for something, much less 30 miles a day. That was expected though. That was normal and you just kind of got to limber with your feet after a while. And uh, there was stories of guys actually sleeping while they're walking, which is pretty impressive <laughs> if I say so myself. So you get where you're going, you make yourself your campment for the night. You might not even bother setting up your tent. A lot of times you would just throw your blanket on the ground. Now, it doesn't have to go straight on the ground. You are given something else that's going to come in handy here. This is called a gum blanket. G-U-M gum. Uh, also sometimes called a, uh, a rubber blanket things like that sort. But basically, the idea here is that this is a rubber-coated sheet of cotton. You put this down on the ground, black side down, and that's going to keep the moisture from coming up and soaking your body while you sleep. Anyone who's ever sat around and watched fireworks in the evening or something like that, your butt gets wet, right? Yes, it does. And that is how you get cold. If he is staying warm, is to stay dry, and this is one of the ways you do that. Now, you may also notice mine is covered in flour. This is also often how men would receive their rations. Your sergeant, me in this case, flips down the blanket and starts piling up each man's rations. This food for the day or usually three days at a time. What a man might receive as his ration, in theory, is a lot of good stuff actually. You're supposed to get a variety of vegetables, um, you know, things like potatoes and stuff like that. Uh, meat, you get a pound of either fresh beef or pork, or a little over that usually if it's dry or salted. Um, you can get bread, either hard or soft, we'll talk about hard bread in a minute. Uh, coffee, molasses, uh, vinegar, sugar, all kinds of good stuff. 
And if you're in a stationary position and supply lines are good and you've got a good quartermaster looking after you, you might get some of that. Mostly, you can rely on four things. Coffee, hardtack, salt pork, and worms, and all of the above. Yes, we'll get to the worms. Um, as far as coffee goes, we get a few ounces a day, uh, officially. My guess, a lot more of it was issued than that because a uh, man by the name of John Billings, after the war, wrote about his account. It's in a book called Hardtack and Coffee, which is probably one of the most popular books. I mean, some of you may have read it. He said that basically every time the army stopped moving, they made and drank their coffee. Every time. They liked their coffee. Now, as far as how you prepare your coffee, though, if you've got options, typically it will be issued <coughs> full, full deep. So, again, you crush it up. A couple of different ways you can do it. My personal favorite put a bunch of the beans in a little poke sack, a little bag, tie it up, crush it with something like a rock. That works pretty well. A lot of guys will tell you, put coffee beans right in the cup, and then you use the soldier's multi-tool. It's also called a bayonet. They're very rarely used in the war. Turns your gun into a spear, but when your rifles are accurate up to 200 yards, they didn't use it a lot. It does, however, work really well for making a lot of noise. Really early in the morning, waking everyone up. It does grind your coffee down. Uh, that was one of your methods. A couple of different ways to do it, but that's the basic premise. Another soldier wrote that what you'd want to do is you'd want to boil your water first, and then put your coffee grounds in. You wouldn't want to do it the other way around. You wouldn't put beans in and then bring it up to a boil. Boil first, then beans. Can you guess that's what you want? Nothing to do with parasites. You got to grind it first anyway, so you're not part of that. Possibly, possibly it's or something. Thanks, Jake. Nope, slightly slower actually, but if you bring it to a boil first, and you're sitting there waiting for your coffee to boil, and your captain says, all right, man, get up, we're moving. Now you've got a half-boiled cup of water, you've lost your water, your beans aren't in it yet, this is gonna do you exactly no good at all. You bring it up to a boil first, though. Put your beans in there then, and he says, get up and move, you can just pick it up, and off you go, and it turns into coffee while you march. <laughs> Works pretty well. I've done it before. I actually did it with a stew, too. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun event. Anyway, um, so there's your method. By the way, I have cooked more meals in this than I have probably on my stove at home. Um, it's amazing what you can do out of a simple cup. Fairly large cup, but it's a cup all the same. And a nice little bale on that. More, you know, all sorts of stews, wonderful things in there when uh, the resources are available. Alright, so there's your coffee. It might be issue green. Federals typically got it roasted. Occasionally it was green and supply was bad. Um, Confederates got less coffee. It's, um, they'd often have to make do with things like chicory and things like that. Um, they would often trade tobacco for coffee when they found Union soldiers who were not too particular about who they talked to. <laughs> Other food. Hard tech. This is your bread ration. Not a complete one. You get about a pound of this a day. Hard tech is what you get when you mix flour water, sometimes a little bit of salt, together into a rough dough, you roll it up flat, you cut it out, and then you bake it until there's no moisture left. The reason you do that is because if there's moisture, it'll go bad. If there's no moisture in it, it stays good almost indefinitely. I know people who made hardtack years ago, and they still bring it out occasionally. Um, but basically, it's uh, hard. I usually break off piece of chew on it, but I'll pass on that this evening. <laughs> You'll get about a pound of this a day. It's about 10 crackers worth. Um, soldiers call them tooth dullers, worm castles is my favorite of them, because if your supply was not particularly good, you could absolutely have worms and weevils and things like that in there. Um, it's possible to chip a tooth eating these. It happened. Um, more often what you would find yourself doing is you could grind it up into little bits, and throw it in your coffee, and that would soften it up a little bit. You can also boil it, and that is a two-part reason you want to do that. First, it softens it up. Second, if there are any little weevils or anything living in there, they kind of float on up to the surface of your coffee or the water. You just skim them on out, or don't. It's entirely up to you, really. It's good extra um, There are a number of soldiers that had a very interesting sense of humor. Um, you find in their journals and things, they'll write things like, 
you know, today we were thrown on a hard tack out of, uh, onto the floor of the trench and the captain came by and asked why we were doing this, we told him that actually we threw it out of the trench, but it crawled back in. <laughs> uh, probably not a true story, but I think it's amusing, both of these, um, private was sitting around, chewing on some hard tack, and he says, ah, Sergeant, there's, there's something soft in my hard tack. And he goes, oh, well, it's probably just a worm, come on, eating it anyway. And he goes, no, it's a nail. <laughs> I enjoy their sense of humor. Uh, but that's the basic premise behind your bread ration. Now, if you're going to be somewhere stationary, they might set up uh, bread ovens in the field and things like that and cook fresh bread. Certainly, if you're stationed at a fort, things like that, you're more likely to get fresh bread issued regularly. Now, the other one that I mentioned was uh, salt pork. Salt pork is pretty bad. People will often compare it to bacon. It is basically the same fundamentally. It's cured pork belly. Uh, the difference is to make salt pork, you pack pork into a barrel and you just cover it in salt. Uh, often there's also a, a salt water brine that goes on top because apparently totally packed in salt is not enough salt. But salt is a preservative. It draws off moisture and it kills bacteria especially in a high salt water environment. Like the Dead Sea, is there anything growing there? No. Why? Because it's really salty. Um, same kind of supplies here. There are people who said that that salt pork could be so salty that if you sliced off a piece of it and touched it to your tongue, it would burn. This is that salty. So the best premise there, soak it a bunch, get some of that salt out first. That helps a lot. It's still really, really salty. Uh, I know guys who've tried this, they've soaked it um, Four times. You bring it up to the boil, let it soak for a little while, empty the water, try it again, repeat, four times. And they said it was still almost too salty to eat. There are accounts of guys taking two pieces of hardtack, a slice of salt pork, and making a sandwich. It sounds really awful. Uh, other, other popular dishes, you can fry up your salt pork in your canteen half, or other tin plate or fry pan, whatever you got. When I say canteen half, I'm referring to this guy. It's literally half of a canteen, and it needs to be cleaned. Um, so if you look at my canteen that I'm wearing over here, oh, it is half. You got one that's kind of damaged, you throw your canteen in the fire, heat it, melt it apart a little bit, and you've got yourself a couple of handy bowls, plates, fry pans, whatever you want to do with them, right? And they're very lightweight and easy to carry. So you put a bunch of bacon in your hard tack, whatever you got in there, kind of stir it up a little bit, and it makes what's called a hellfire stew or skilly gilly, depending on who you talk to. And uh, it's again, not as bad as it sounds. It's basically pork and bread, which is pretty good. And you fry it all together, and I know a guy who makes it regularly. I think it's a little salty for my taste, but that's just me. Either way, that's a popular dish. You might, if you're lucky, get what's called desiccated vegetables. Desiccated vegetables are it's like a dehydrated vegetable, except it's not dehydrated in the same way that we do it now with air. Uh, what they do is they actually get a heavy press, like an industrial press, and squeeze the moisture out of mashed up vegetables. Uh, so squeeze it and press it until most of the liquid is gone, and then allow it to dry. What you get is like a, like a hard vegetable cake, kind of like a, like a, like a veggie patty almost, uh, except it's going to be quite hard and crumbly. So you can get some of that, throw that in some hot water, actually makes a pretty decent stew. <coughs> It's hard to get an approximation of it now with dehydrated vegetables for about as close as we can get. Those are your regular food items. <coughs> Sounds delicious day in and day out, right? <coughs> a lot of guys would get them three days at a time. That was standard practice. So you get, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, dinner all at once. And a lot of guys didn't want to carry them. You're getting three pounds of pork, three pounds of bread, plus whatever other stuff they can scrounge up and give you. Which means you're talking about probably seven or eight pounds of stuff hanging off your shoulder, and you've already got about six pounds in your cartridge box, and you got your belts, and you got your heavy canteen, and your 20 pounds of knapsack, and your, you know, wolf uh, belt around your body. These things get really heavy, so what they would do, they just cook it all up and eat it all up all at once. <laughs> Which is, remember, two pounds, of, uh, two pounds, three pounds of meat, three pounds of bread. And uh, whatever else they can get you in terms of vegetables and things. It might save another day or so. Now that works really well in the short term. You're like, oh look, how light and easy this is to carry now. Except by the end of day two, you're starving to death again. Uh, you process it quickly, get rid of it. 
still a common practice. So there's your food. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? No. And that's if you could get all of that. There are accounts of uh, the supply being very poor. Remember, we're taking wagons and running them through enemy country. The Confederates are tearing up train tracks. They're harassing wagons. One of the best ways to slow down an army is to stop its supplies, right? Army marches on its stomach. We've probably all heard it somewhere before, right? And it's true. If you don't have ammunition, if you don't have food, you really can't do much. It's a common practice. I read an account recently of two officers who, between them, had one piece of hardtack for dinner. They broke it in half, they each ate a half, and then went to bed. Sounds wholesome, doesn't it? Also accounts of uh, similar, of like you know, a couple of officers having one or two pieces of hard tech for themselves, a couple of privates having just a little bit of pork left. Between the three or four of them, they all kind of threw it all together and had about that much food, but it was slightly better than if they had just eaten their own share. So supplies are not always good. And certainly if you're in a siege situation, it's even worse, because that's the point. Cool. Good. So we're marching all day. Hot, sweaty, or freezing at night, probably, not splitting with the buddy. You're eating terrible food. Your snazzy uniform is not, um, not as comfortable as one might have originally imagined, it turns out. Uh, snazzy, yes, comfy, no. So these guys didn't exactly get what they signed up for, and certainly we know the war was not over by Christmas. Um, there's uh, a war would go on for, well, let's say, five Aprils, right? April, April, April. And they would see some of the worst atrocities committed by mankind. Uh, the weaponry of the time has advanced quite far ahead of the tactics. So you see some of these images. The guys are still lining up shoulder to shoulder, walking face first into the enemy. They let stop, all load, and fire their guns in a straight line. The idea is that basically you turn a group of men into a shotgun. In fact, in the British Army, they were told, don't even aim, just level that whole line. It was considered ungentlemanly to aim. Americans aim. <laughs> <laughs> and they are firing what are called mini balls at each other. Now, mini balls, contrary to the name, are not balls. Uh, it's not the way that we think of the word. Um, ball during the period just refers to a projectile. So kind of come around a little bit. This is what they're firing. Now, this is going to be a little different than what was being fired during the American Revolution and some of those prior wars. Prior to this, we're using literally round balls and a smooth bore musket. That means the inside of the barrel is just a straight, smooth tube. This is not a ball, right? It actually looks relatively close to a modern bullet shape, with one notable exception. The back end of it is hollow, and that's on purpose. See, the idea was that they had rifling in muskets for a long, long time, almost as long as muskets had been around. People figured out how to put a rifling on, a little spin in the barrel, right? It was a problem. For a rifled musket to be very accurate, the ball is going to fit very, very tightly into the barrel, which means when you draw your ramrod to push it down, it's work, especially after it's been fired a few times and there's a little bit of gunk in the barrel. Is this very quick? <laughs> no, this takes forever. So you'd be more accurate, yes, but it takes forever to fire. This changes that. That hollow in the back there, when the gunpowder touches off down there, it expands that open space in the back. So it grabs the rifle and still slides down very easily. If I drop this, it would slide all the way to the bottom, which I'm not going to do because I wouldn't get it out. Um, but it would slide all the way down to the bottom very easily. Expand the back, grab that rifle, and it becomes almost as accurate as a modern rifle. Now, a soldier, a good one, can fire this about three times a minute. It's very difficult to do well. I can do it under very serene situations where, you know, I'm sitting in a park and I've got a group of people in front of me like yourselves. I can do it. Beautiful sunny day, right? Under battle conditions with a foul up musket, almost certainly not. That was sort of the standard, it was three rounds a minute. So if you and your thousands of friends are all standing in front of those guys and their thousands of friends, firing three rounds a minute with an uh, almost modern rifle accurate weapon, this is a problem. They're marching within 100 yards of each other and blasting away, and the casualties are catastrophic. The nation is going to be shocked by the casualty rates. Um, 
say, April 62, for example, the Battle of Shiloh, we're going to see over 20,000 casualties from that battle. It's a two-day battle. That was more people dying or wounded or missing than the entire American Revolutionary War put together. Two days. The nation was shocked and appalled, and the commander of that particular battle really mucked it up. Ruined his military career. Uh, you probably never heard of him. His name is Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Nobody, right? And he obviously did not ruin his military career. He was reinstated later, but he did suffer for it considerably. Now, what they were discovering very quickly was that what they had been doing before is not working very well. Didn't stop them from doing it, though. You still all the way to the end of the war. You see men lining up. Hundreds, thousands of men in a line and marching straight into what's called canister shell, which is what they fire out of a cannon when they're within a couple of hundred yards. We're all familiar roughly with how a shotgun works. Lots of little pellets that do this when they come out, right? Same principle, just with, you know, almost golf ball size pellets. There are accounts of men marching up one of the hills at Gettysburg trying to take a cannon position. The Union artillery there opened fire on them with double canister shots, with two compartments of the stuff. They just disappeared. Nothing left of the men that marched up that hill after they fired. Now those men saw the enemy coming and they fired the bit they had to do to survive, but on seeing what had happened, they broke down and cried. And I can't blame them. These are horrible things that these men endured. They're living poorly. They are suffering considerably, um, and they still did, which I find to be incredible. There are a lot of guys who would write home and say things like, this life is absolutely horrible and it's not for me, but so many of them stay. Despite the fact that they're going through what they're going through, eating poorly, all those things, they stay. People did deserve it, they haven't, but not nearly as many as you'd think consider, right? The reason for that is probably in large part due to the fact that when people would join up, they would form their companies, so a group of about 100 men usually let that happen, and their regiments on the an area, locals. So you'd join up with your, your friends, your brother, your preacher, all the people in the town, they'd get together, they'd join up, and they'd go off and fight together. So you're standing shoulder to shoulder with your best friend down here, your cousins over there, are you going to abandon them in this, you know, during this? No, they're not running, you're not going to run either, except they're not running because you're not running, right? <laughs> it's a good system. Well. So the problem with that, though, yeah, it did tend to help people stick around a little bit, maybe more so, because you certainly wouldn't want to go home and have everybody tell you that, you know, hey, you know, cousin so-and-so ran from battle and all of just walked in the door. Uh, no, nobody wanted to face that when they went home. There was a problem, though. There are times when an entire regiment is going to suffer great casualties. Think about what that would do to a small farm community. You just lost a good chunk of your young, able men from a generation. There are towns that were no longer valid towns by the end of the Civil War, because there just weren't enough people there. You get uh, engagements like at Gettysburg, you, you know, you've all heard of Gettysburg, right? 24th Michigan <clears throat> marches into battle early then. They're part of the Iron Brigade, a relatively recently new part of the Iron Brigade, because they're a fairly cracked regiment or cracked, uh, cracked core of troops, not to be, you know, outdone. They're leading the charge on things and all the things they're doing. They're deployed right in the front, and they meet up with a group called the 26th North Carolina. North Carolina guys have about 800 men. 24th Michigan guys have about 500. By the end of the day, they will both have suffered the highest casualties in their respective armies in the entire war. 500 men, roughly 499 actually, from the 24th Michigan will go into battle that morning. About 80 are left for roll call that afternoon. Yep. Now, they're not all dead, but none of them are in good shape, right? You're missing, you're captured, you're horribly wounded, amputation is the main 
solution to an injury at that time. Um, one of the most horrible things you can ever read about the Civil War is the surgical medical end of things. There are accounts of after uh, major battles of surgeons at work, they can take a limb off in like 12 to 14 minutes, and there are piles, piles of arms and legs. And imagine the smell of this. And this is not a quick process. If you've got 10,000 men who are wounded, and you are number 900, you know, 9,500 in line, you've got days of waiting, wounded, agonizing, with busted bones. It's one of the problems with those particular bullets that they don't have to sort of skip past your bones like a modern one does. They smash through the bone. They rip and they tear and they uh, rend fairly horribly. And so you're waiting there in agony with very little in the way of painkillers, waiting to have your legs sawn off while you lay out in the hot sun for three days. It's unpleasant. Well, so you lose about, you, you scale it up to the less conservative numbers, roughly 720,000 people are going to die. Or are casualties, I should say. Um, if you adjusted that to a modern population, it's 4 million people, I think. Combined population of our 11 least populous states. Imagine losing 11 states worth of or within a four year period. If you total up every other American conflict and all the casualties endured, we still have not scratched the number. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's because it was Americans on both sides. That's true. Even if you cut the number roughly in half, it's still an absurd number of Americans who fought in back this cause. Now, the question, of course, everyone wants to know is well, why? What were people fighting for? And this is a topic that will be discussed at length by many, many people and will never really receive a satisfactory answer. Uh, because frankly, it was different things to different people. I bet if I went around the room and asked every one of you what you've heard about why the war was fought, I'll probably get at least a dozen different answers like Most of you hear about slavery. Some people will tell you states' rights. Some will say as, you know, as far as things like taxation without representation, because there's a certain amount of that going on. The fact of the matter was it meant different things to different people. They would join up for personal reasons, they'd join up for political reasons. Some people wanted to free the slaves. They believed it was a horrible institution and that was worth fighting for. There are people who did not care whatsoever about slavery, including many of the people leading in this war. Most of the quotes you'll hear from Lincoln in regards to slavery, aside from the fact that yes, it's horrible, are going to be along the lines of if we can bring them back into the Union without freeing any slaves. That's what it takes. We will do it. If I can do it, I think the quote's officially, if I can do it by freeing all the slaves, I will do that. If I can do it by freeing none of the slaves, I will do that. If I can do it by freeing some of the slaves and not freeing others, I will do that too. So the Great Liberator, I kind of think like the feelings on the matter of the Bronx, but it means different things to different people. But either way, mostly I think at the end of the day, these guys lived together, they marched together, ate together. Most soldiers, I think, really the reason that most of them were fighting by the end of the war was for each other. You ask any soldiers at this time, even, they'll tell you pretty much the same thing, but at the end of the day, it's about the guy next to you. And during the Civil War, he's literally right next to you. So, Always more to share, but does anybody have any questions, comments about well, the things we've covered today so far? You know, and I'm kind of somber in a little bit because it's fairly shocky, but always good to get up such a good question. And maybe there's not an obvious answer, but why did they stand, you know, like 100 dollars or why did they go behind cover and all that instead of, you know? It's a good question. So the tactics of, that were being used before the uh, Civil War are what we call the holding eye tactics. Now, the main reason that they're fighting the they're fighting is that the muskets, the rifles that they were using at the time, were not very accurate. They're good to maybe 75 yards, which is not very far. It's not even a football, right? The way to get the most 
out of your shooting is to get fairly close, everybody fire at once, and you get this sort of cloud of bullets going down range. Right? So everybody stands there and shoots straight ahead, you're going to hit something, right? Each person is sort of spread out in those picking shots, like the like more modern conflict. You might entirely miss every single shot. Right? Uh, and so they would, in the time beforehand, fight shoulder to shoulder like that. And the, the phrase is master fire. It means they're basically trying to put as much bullets down, or as many bullets down range as they possibly can, right? <coughs> um, but by the time the Civil War rolls around, it, the, the weapons have gotten better. Unfortunately, the generals fighting this battle, or these battles rather, are older. They learned to fight in the decades prior. They were old school. Yeah, they were old school. They hadn't quite kept up with what the new equipment could do. So the medicine hasn't caught up, the uh, tactics haven't caught up, and that is where you're going to see so many casualties. Um, it's because they weren't responsive. Now, that's not to say that that was exclusively the case. Um, you're fighting in um, that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder fashion some of the time. Um, by the end of the war, you see a lot of what's called skirmishing. And the idea is basically that you spread out typically about five paces apart, and men are given a little more freedom to move and seek cover and fire as they, uh, as they need to. But this is not a way to necessarily take a position or hold a position. It's meant to slow down the enemy, to kind of cover your own troops a little bit, uh, or mostly just to provide kind of a, a perimeter for the army so that you can't get snuck up on. You send your skirmishers out a mile away from the rest of the camp so that anybody coming up would hit them, they'd start firing and falling back, and then that would give the rest of the army time to actually get up and moving. I talked about the Battle of Shiloh earlier. Um, they didn't have a great ring around, defensively speaking, around their encampment. So Grant and Sherman are bringing all their forces together in Tennessee, right along the river there, they're going to start moving through Tennessee and into Mississippi. Um, but they didn't have good defenses up. They didn't have that security system around. And so the Confederates were actually able to smash into them fairly unexpectedly. Um, they turned the whole thing into just a ball, actually. It was a <coughs> kind of a mess, actually. <laughs> uh, fairly chaotic fighting as a whole. So there's a, by the end of the war, we see a little bit of that, and also see guys starting to dig trenches. The end of the Civil War looks an awful lot like the beginning of World War I. Um, you don't have the machine guns, you don't have the mustard gas. Gatling guns are almost never used. People will hear about them, but they're almost never used in the Civil War. They're just cumbersome and don't work very well at the time. Um, but they are digging trenches. In fact, it got to a point where men would say, basically, as soon as they stopped moving anywhere, they'd stop grab their bayonets, grab their canteen hats, and they start picking and shoveling their way down and creating just something to put up in front of them. Because the generals may not have been learning that they were. <laughs> um, they, they figured out that you need to sort of have something in front of you, have some sort of cover for this uh, style of fighting. Um, so actually by the end of the war, you've got like the Siege of Petersburg, um, and some of the Siege of Atlanta, and things like that, where these guys are stopped, they're digging trenches, and they're basically just sitting around waiting for the other army to run out of supplies. Um, so they want in trees for them to like stand behind them and we'll, we'll, we'll also, so some of the fighting does happen in forested areas, which by the way makes trying to move in a line formation really difficult. Um, but so there's a little bit of cover, but really what you'll find happens is if you're under artillery fire, those trees don't last very to be perfectly honest. Um, if, you will, if you see pictures of some of these battlefields, the, um, between the gunfire and the cannon rounds, the trees are splintering and just coming apart. Um, you get battles like um, the Second Battle of the Wilderness, which is part of France. It's called the Overland Campaign uh, in 64. He's kind of moving south of Virginia, trying to take Richmond and Petersburg. Um, and Lee stops in a place they call the Wilderness. What happens is actually it's the right time of year, the right temperature, the sparks and the flame from the cannons and the muskets going off are creating forest fires, um, which I might imagine do complicate things slightly. Um, one of the most horrible things that I've read is actually that 
basically that there were wounded men out in the field that they couldn't get to because of these fires. And so as you fell asleep that night, what you listen to? The sound of people burning alive. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Oh, and by the way, they had fought over the same piece of ground the year before, too. So this is, you know, not like there was even anything had been gained up to that point. They were literally fighting over the same piece of ground. But so there is, there are trees and things from around the cover behind, but they don't really last very long, unfortunately. Um, and that's not the nature of how they were fighting. When you're moving in a line, you need an open space to do it. Otherwise, I mean, imagine you're all standing over your shoulder trying to walk through something like the chairs or something like that. You're, it, it, people get spread out, they break it up, they move them apart, and you don't keep that line formation that you're trying to. So, you can't maneuver that way, you can't really fire effectively that way because there things in the way. Most of them are fighting in open spaces. I know, it seems utterly preposterously stupid to us now. But yeah, that was the I read that a lot of people did have their diamond on their uh, diamond? Yeah, because you seem to get really small. That's where I'm going. It didn't have a sense to, you know, not to walk next to each other because, you know, because that puts up a wall, because you're forming a wall where you can just get shot. The idea, though, is that you are firing like a, you know, one big cloud of bullets going down range. They're thinking the same thing. It's a way of keeping your shots nice and close and tight together, which is, does a fairly Fairly horrible amount of damage. There's accounts of like after a total volley, just everybody firing at once. You hear the gunshot, and then a moment later, they just hear just this moan go up from the other side because you're hit just a dozen people with that shot. I know it, it, it sounds tremendously stupid. I agree with you. Generally speaking, shooting at each other is incredibly stupid. So <laughs> yeah, I think we can just call it. We'll agree on that point and move on from there. Um, yes, yeah, I'm not going to be able to go back unfortunately and tell them. <laughs> oh, um, wasn't the uh, 24th of Michigan the same on the same hill that, uh, that Joshua Chamberlain fought on? Nope, uh, opposite ends actually. So, uh, so Chamberlain, I think, actually one of his, um, if you watch the movie Gettysburg, he's, you know, features prominently there. He leads, he's a colonel who leads the 20th Maine. The 20th Maine is a regiment um, that gets plucked down at the extreme left of the Union line. Remember, you're not only fighting with a handful of guys in a line, it's an entire army stretched out in the line. 20th Maine is the very far end of a, little, a place called Little Round Top. Um, and it's just been here. Yeah, well, I was surprised how small it is. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Okay, but so we walked Pickett's Charge, and I was shocked at how big it really was. It's about a mile of open terrain, another tremendously stupid maneuver. Uh, but as I said, all of it is. Um, 20th Maine, though, so they're down at the far end, and the Confederates are trying to get up around what's called a flank. The idea is that if you can get up on somebody's side, they can't all shoot this way. That doesn't work because there's too many people in the way. That's how you shoot your buddy in the eye, right? Um, but if you are this way, you can have all of your people shooting. So this is a really bad position to be in. You don't want to be flanked. That's what the Confederates are trying to do. They're trying to get up around the Union line, hit them from the side, hit them in the rear. Kind of rule them on it. So Chamberlain's told basically that you are the extreme left. Nobody gets past you, you hold until the last. Because if he fails, the whole thing is over, basically, right? Um, so he's down at that far end though, holding up against that's Longstreet's court, down at that end. The 24th Michigan is actually kind of at the other end more toward town. If you've been, those of you who've been, it's who's closer more toward town fleeing backwards through McPherson's woods, then back through town, and they end up kind of back at that end. Um, you know, you talked about the food ration. Yes. What about the pay? The pay. And what, how did the paymaster get his money out? So your private, in the uh, Union Army would make about $12, $13 a month is what your pay is, which goes a lot farther than it does now. Um, the problem was often that they weren't paid regularly, uh, which is probably for the best. A lot of people ended up sort of gambling their way pretty fast. Um, but you were paid by the paymaster, you show up, and you actually, this is where we start to see the birth of what's called greenbacks, um, which we still occasionally refer to money that way, but that's a new, relatively new idea. It's a federal government backed currency, uh, and it almost starts with more like a voucher than anything else. That basically, this is worth 
this much gold and to be paid out if you ever technically presented it to the government, which nobody ever does. But a lot of soldiers were paid in this sort of federal script, which they call greenbacks, eventually becomes the US dollar. But you, basically, you'd show up, you'd get your money, and you'd have to go gamble it away and, it was and play right checkbook. Right. Say again? It was retroactive. Right yes. Um, so yeah, you'd often get paid months and months at a time because you wouldn't have been paid for the last three months. Um, so as you go on up, corporals, I think, get paid the same, actually. They just have slightly more responsibility. I like to describe them to my new guys as like a super private. You're a private who can tell other privates what to do. That's your job. Um, Sergeants would make slightly more. I think it's close to like eighteen dollars a month if you're a first sergeant, like I am. Uh, that's what the diamond means. You typically, you see the guy holding the flag right here. He's got three stripes on his shoulder. He's also a sergeant. He does not have the diamond on top. Um, and the reason for that is that he is a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh sergeant. <coughs> they all have jobs to do. Mostly, it's stand behind everybody, and make sure nobody runs away, uh, and fix weapons that are malfunctioning and things like that. Um, first sergeant, your job is not only to uh, basically take over if the officers are incapacitated during the battle, um, you're at the far right end of the line, and also, most importantly, you have a lot of paperwork to do. <laughs> you're doing roll call and things like that. Uh, so your first sergeant really is the guy who sort of runs and operates the company, so they get paid slightly more. As you go on up, captains and all those guys start making a fair bit more. Uh, I think generals end up, depending on which army, slightly more than the Confederate army, interestingly. Generals get paid close to $300 a month or so, give or take a little. Give you just a rough idea of what people are making in this conflict. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the percentage of time that you spend actually not in battle versus being in battle. I mean, what would that work out to be? I don't have a ratio for you, and it very wildly through the group. So there are, um, you know, there are regiments that are going to see just the worst of the fighting, and there are other regiments that are going to sit on their keys the whole time. There are, uh, like, so for example, from Michigan, we got mm, 31, I think 30, 31 regiments of infantry, and from like 29, 32, <laughs> those guys never saw any action. They, were, they came in late in the war, they never saw anything, they basically hung around the, the port for a while. There are other regiments, though, that saw constant action. Uh, the main consistent thing you'll get, though, is that mostly the battling and fighting, all those things are going on from like, April through October, and then after that, it really slows down. The reason for that is that the roads become terrible, it's cold, nobody wants to do anything when it's cold, right? Um, so you go to what's called winter quarters, and a lot of you spend months with almost nothing to do, more or less. Military life continues, so you're still pulling guard and things like that, but mostly you're killing time. Um, I think most people probably hated winter camp quite a lot, because by the end of it, you're sick of your four walls. Uh, most soldiers, when they went into winter camp, would have to make their own little cabins for the winter. Because you're not like going to a fort to hang out, necessarily. Some guys did, and that's great, but most people were camped in the field. And they would actually make little cabins. And there was no oversight, necessarily, or direction on how to do it. We were kind of just turned loose to go and forage up some wood and make yourself some sort of cabin. So I'm sure quality varied wildly. Um, one of the accounts I read, uh, I think my second Michigan book I read, the guys, four of them, got on a little, one of those little train, hand cart style thing, and they followed the tracks for a while. They found a little abandoned station nobody was using. They pulled the buildings apart, they stacked up all those planks, and then they hoped on their way back a couple of miles back, and they built their quarters out of that. You can also saw timber and things like that. There was one um, where they, they went into their winter camp, and they, they went into winter camp like three different times in different places. So they were told, you know, all right, this is where you're going to stay for the winter. Go ahead and make quarters. So they start cutting trees and making their little chimneys and stuff. They get pretty elaborate. Um, if you're like a mason, for example, they said you found more work for yourself than you really ever wanted. You can just build like everybody's chimney on their little cabin. And they got them all just about set. And they went, oh, we're moving. So they abandoned them, left, went to a new place, made new winter quarters, and they did it again later. Um, but as far as your actual, how much time you spent on average, um, Fighting versus just marching, you're mostly marching. You're mostly in camp. Um, you might find yourself doing some skirmishing, which happened a lot more than a full-on battle would, where you'd have you know, a couple of companies kind of bump into each other and are trading rounds back and forth, just kind of feeling out where the enemy is, what their strengths are, that kind of thing. Remember, we don't have 
any aerial surveillance. We don't have walkie-talkies or anything with the, the modern conveniences that help you find where the enemy is. Your main things are running cavalry around and you're running your pickets out, which are your, your um, those, you know, kind of scattered guys. We will well, roughly find out where the enemy is, create a few rounds to see what your lines are like, and then fall back. And there's a lot of that going on, so you might burn off a couple of rounds here and there, but mostly. Long periods of nothing followed by short periods of excitement is the most people will define more as such. What was the death benefit? The death benefit? There is a pension that soldiers will draw after the war. Uh, it's usually something pitifully low, um, depends on how long somebody was serving and things like that, but it's, you see things are like, I got my pension, it was like 75 cents. <laughs> it was crazy. Would your widow get? Yes, widows can draw. Um, I think your children are allowed to if their um, their mother has passed. There are others who occasionally try to stretch it out a little longer. They manage to justify it somehow, but mostly it's your widow and children can draw that pension. Um, there's interestingly one exactly one woman after the war who drew a pension as a soldier. Her name was Sarah Emma Edmonds. She was from you know, she was from Canada. Um, her father was trying to sort of force her into a marriage she didn't want, so she ran away to Michigan, became a Bible salesman in Flint, and um, went by the name Franklin Thompson. She found that uh, people took her more seriously when she was a man. Um, I know, totally different now, right? <laughs> and discovered that, you know what, she wanted to serve her new country, so she joins the army. And she joins with the 2nd Michigan Army Service and fights with them. She's actually um, serves sort of just scouting and reconnaissance and things like that. There's some accounts that say she was briefly a spy also. I'm not sure how much of that really washes out. Um, but about 1863, she came down with pneumonia. And that's usually when female soldiers who are dressed as men found that they had a problem because now you have to go see the doctor. That sounds like the thing that she had in mind. It is. Yep. Basically the exact same time as so she caught pneumonia and went, uh-oh, this is going to go badly. So she technically deserted. She fled. She didn't, you know, was no longer serving as a soldier. She tried to go back to civilian life and things like that. After the war, though, her fellow soldiers had all liked her so well that they helped her. They petitioned Congress again and again and again and again. And finally, wore down Congress, and she got a soldier's pension. It was like 1880-something. It was, it was quite a bit later, but she did. Are you saying her fellow soldiers knew she was a female? I mean, let's face it, they right. bathed together and all these things and... My belief is that generally, guys probably kind of knew, and as long as she was pulling her weight, they probably didn't make a fuss about it. Um, but I find it really hard to imagine that you're bathing together, you're living together, you are constantly around each other, Someone's got to notice something, you know, like... <laughs> there are a bunch of young men who might be a little inexperienced, but I think they can gather the general idea. Um, so, I think mm, there were probably people who at least suspected, would be my guess, whether they were actually going to outright confront her about it, though. Couldn't say. Um, I have heard numbers quoted as high as roughly 400 women might have served uh, dressed as a man. There is almost no way to verify any of that, though, because it's sort of clandestine by nature, right? Um, even after the war, if you've been like, ah, it turns out I was a woman all along, <laughs> your marriage prospects just dried up pretty fast, probably, you know. Um, especially if the available men hadn't served, you know, that's it's the Victorian era, that's a little bit of masculinity, I would think. Um, but at the same time, it's the Victorian era. So you're, you know, the, the clothing is fairly either loose or very restricting. In the case of the coat I'm wearing today, it's tailored within an inch of its life, which is the way it's supposed to look. Um, this other coat is very blousy. She might have been able to hide it. I don't know. But yeah, there's, uh, there may have been more. There's a couple of accounts that have been absolutely debunked, though, too. Um, so, you know, there's women over after the world looking for. Uh, notoriety and attention. There's one that she actually carried on as a man until like she's in her 80s or something. She's 
they fight a car. <laughs> Which is a strange way to out a Civil War soldier. Um, yeah, the soldier was hit by a car. But again, injured, and they went, oh my god, you're... Oh. So yeah, the right age is like 80 something, 90 something. The truth comes out. Can you talk about your own collection of clothing? Are you, how do reenactors acquire what you have? You just opened up a huge box. <laughs> okay, so I made a lot of my stuff because I have fairly high standards for how I want my clothing to be authentically speaking. There's, um, as with all things, you get what you pay for. There are really good reproduction pieces um, that you can get. And there are really bad reproduction pieces you can get. And some people are not super choosy about what they buy. I'm very choosy. So I find a way to save a lot of money is to not pay for it, but make it myself. Which is cool, because then you get a look inside of what you're wearing, and you become a little bit more intimately familiar with what it is you're wearing. Well, I noticed the inside of, you had a jacket. Yes. And the inside of it looked very nicely tailored. This one? Yeah. It is, isn't it? I, I got this fabric for such a deal, it was very exciting. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so this is this is my sack coat. Uh, this is one that I made. Um, it was drafted off an original pattern. Um, the inside is lined with more wool, by the way. So it's a wool coat on the outside and a wool coat on the inside. But it looks softer on the inside. Uh, you be the judge. It's not bad. Yeah. It's actually probably a little bit scratchier on the inside than on the outside. Um, but it is lined, yes. Um, complete with maker stamps. Um, so a lot of the stuff at the time is still being hand sewn. Um, so there's some of that you'll find in a lot of the equipment. But also, sewing machines are becoming fairly popular, especially in the north. Um, you're talking about millions of coats being produced, and millions of pairs of pants, and things like that. There's not some, you know, people are not hand sewing all of it. So some, some machines are starting to come in, which does make reproducing them a little bit easier. Um, I know guys who get really fussy, and they try to do like a period sewing machine. <laughs> I have one on the store again. Um, I have one of those guys on the way I'm lining you up. Um, <laughs> But mostly, it's, I, I make a lot of my stuff. Now, there are plenty of places, though, also that make reproductions that are more commercially available. Um, you're not going to obviously find them when you go to Meijer or Target. <laughs> um, just not going to find them that way. But there are, it's like any of the kind of nuanced hobbies. And you talk to train guys, and there's a whole industry of people who make little model trains and all the pieces that go with it that most of us are probably blissfully unaware of, right? Um, once you're kind of into the hobbies, we call it. You find that there are a lot of people producing this stuff. You just have to kind of know where to look. Uh, and there are usually very helpful people in your reenacting groups to point you in the right direction. Uh, as far as the stuff that I've got, as I kind of showed you most of it, uh, I know some of it came kind of fast. Um, but the. Uh, <clears throat> some of these things are, uh, eh, you know. Hours and hours and hours of hand sewing, like this one, is all sewn by hand because that's how they were produced originally. Um, now, did you do this one too? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the stuff is, like I said, it's, uh, yeah. you, to, to do it the right way requires <laughs> kind of getting into that 19th century mindset and just accepting that it's going to take a while to do it. Um, but what's interesting actually is there's a company that makes the, the sold the kit that I used to make this one, and I'm that set cook with my another one that I have. Um, it's kind of an interesting little story that goes with it. Um, they reproduce kits that you can assemble yourself of these couple of different uniform pieces. Uh, you get shirts, and you can get some coats, and trousers, and a handful of other things. Um, what they do is they send you all the pieces, the thread, uh, some wax for your thread, and buttons, and all the things you're going to need to put it together, except needles and scissors and they ship it to you, and you put it together yourself with directions. And what makes that neat is that the pieces that they are making those kits of are from what's called the Schuylkill Arsenal. That's uh, an arsenal in Pennsylvania from the government that's producing uniforms, and it's been doing so since like the Revolutionary War. Uh, they're making munitions, I know, and they're not actually not active anymore, but they're making um, <clears throat> munitions, they're making clothing, they're making all this stuff. And what they mostly are doing is they're actually Cutting out the pieces, putting in little bundles, 
sending them out to local families for the women to sew to make a little bit of extra money while their husbands and brothers and things are off fighting. So when you get that, you're kind of continuing a tradition from the days back to the Civil War. That you sort of you get the pieces, you assemble it together, and they sell it back to the company and make a little bit of money that way. So I know the, the talk is called Soldier Life, but really the, the um, there's a major civilian presence too. Uh, I talked about a lot of the stuff the government's going to give you, but what I didn't show you was all the little stuff that's in here. Uh, you know, little combs and candles and toiletries and things that soldiers will carry. A lot of that's going to come from home, and it's going to be uh, also going to come from uh, it's called the Sanitary Commission, which they do not get enough attention as a group. Um, they are basically the forebearers of a lot of very historically significant movements. Um, basically, this is the first time in American history that a bunch of women are going to band together on a national scale and start working together for a common goal. There's been groups working together before that, and they're going to work together very closely with their community for support of soldiers or whatever it might be. But this is the first time really that the whole country is going to come together and they're going to work on something. They're going to help get uniforms made and socks you know, things that soldiers need, um, and they're going to produce them and get them to the soldiers. A lot of the women who are heavily involved in the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission, which does similar work, are going to go on and form the Sarge movement. They're going to ramp it up. It's been going on a little bit since before that, but they're going to take what they learned from the, the, the other commissions, and they're going to roll it right on into suffrage and things like that. They're a whole other conversation, but it is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody on this side wants to talk except me. There we go. <laughs> I always hate when I'm just talking to one side of the room mostly. Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, deserters. So you, you touched on it there, and I was uh, in many wars, you know, you're shot. So but I thought that it sounds like there was lots of desertion of folks who just, oh, I'm done with this, or oh, I have my brother, I'm out of here. So how was that handled during this war? Uh, you're hanged. It was still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if they caught you, or if they didn't get, like how 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 would they go after you for years? Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah. I mean, remember you can't show your face after that. Like you have to basically abandon your home, and your family, and all that. Now that being said, they didn't look that hard because one, it's just not good PR, and two, this is the Victorian era. There's no computers, you don't have a driver's license, there's no databases tracking what you look like or your fingerprints. I could literally walk three towns over and say, hi, my name is Bob, and suddenly I'm Bob. Like, you just, there isn't a level of uh, security around our identities that exist today. It'd be relatively easy to just sort of disappear and reinvent yourself elsewhere, which you wouldn't need to do because your family would be shamed. Uh, but yeah, if you're caught, yeah, you're right. You may also be flogged. Um, I think it was Grant, it might have been, that said the uh, Grant and Jefferson did it, one of the other. Um, they're very interchangeable. <laughs> um, that's the absolute worst use of a soldier there. So, actually, Jefferson Davis, interesting side note, despite being a uh, graveless rebel, um, he basically commuted almost every death sentence that came across his desk. And there was what, enough coming already. What was the percentage? Like, well, how, how, how was the desertion? Was it a big deal or not a big deal? Well, it, it had been more so earlier in the war. Um, you get comments that show up kind of later in the war that basically says the men are all hardened veterans, all the shirkers and deserters have left by now. So you get a high rate, an elderly high rate fairly quickly, and then it drops off fairly sharply after that because the men who remain are in it. You know, and, and they'll be writing for years how much they hate. Uh, you know, that they're, they're sick, they're miserable, um, they're, they think they're going to go off to fight, they're scared. And they'll say that in their letters home for years. <laughs> and they say, um, so most people did, there was desertion, it tapers off the further in you go. Just, you know, and there's a certain amount that stays up though because you are Replenishing units as they go along too. So as you have new guys, some of them fail too. I don't have a good number of how many people would have deserted, but I'll tell you that when they list off your any of your casualties in a battle, it's like Gettysburg, it's like 53,000 casualties. A good chunk of those are missing. 
how many of those are disappeared when a cannon went off next to them, uh, and how many of them are just kind of uh, out the back while well, you guys are busy up front. <laughs> uh, Mostly it's not as bad as it seems like it should have been, but it, yes, it absolutely does still happen. And there are fairly strict consequences for what does happen. For <coughs> yes? No. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, were there any Michigan judgments that actually fought, like, that actually fought in the West? Justin Peterson's <coughs> with, with General Grant? Yes. Um, so I portray often a soldier. I mean, there we go. The 15th Michigan. This is my western hat. Um, and they, they fought the West as did, um, a number of other ones, too. Um, so the, what is referred to as the Western theater is uh, everything that isn't Virginia and eastern Tennessee and Kentucky. <laughs> they say Western theater that used to mean along the Mississippi at the time that uh, Grant and Sherman had basically taken care of business along the Mississippi River and opened that up entirely for union purposes. They come east. Grant's going to take control of the Army of the Potomac, and or actually all the Union armies, but specifically the Army of the Potomac, and go after Lee in eastern Virginia. Sherman's going to come around out through Georgia and do the march to the sea and all that stuff. Um, so yes, there are Michigan units that are going to serve. The 15th Michigan's got a really interesting story, actually. Um, it goes along with Shiloh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so these, the 15th Michigan forms up out of Monroe in kind of February, March of 62. They load up, they get on a boat, and they head down to Tennessee to Pittsburgh Landing, which is right behind the Battle of Shiloh. Literally, they land. The, um, well, they're actually on the boat, sorry. Um, the officers are asking their colonel, and uh, John Oliver, says, should we give the boys their ammunition? He says, no, because there's rebels along the shore that are occasionally popping shots, and I don't want to give a bunch of untested troops uh, of the ammunition on this boat, because there's hundreds of us on a boat. <laughs> this is not a place to have a fire pit. So he doesn't issue the ammunition. His orders are, once we've landed, then give it to him. Well, it doesn't happen. So they get in, they crash, they sleep, they wake up in the morning to the sounds of battle, they form up, they go out. Still no ammunition. They figure, we'll pick it up along the way somewhere. They are unattached. They don't have a, a, a core or a brigade that they're a part of. It's just a loose regiment floating around waiting to be given orders. They find a group going by to say, can I attach myself to you? The colonel or the uh, general there says, it would be a pleasure. Come along. And he flunks them, not knowing, right at the far left of his line. Johnson's Confederates smash into them, and they go, <laughs> Now. This is where it becomes an interesting story. Because you and I would have gone, bye. <laughs> uh, their colonel told them to fix bayonets and to stand fast. Oh my god. Which they did until they were ordered away. Now, officially, the order, uh, or the, the report written after the battle, because you gotta write reports, said, and we retired in good order. One of the soldiers, however, wrote that he ran so fast <laughs> that he felt like there was a cannonball right behind him, chasing him. <laughs> so there's some disagreement about how they moved back out of the fighting. Um, they actually managed to find a, a, a regiment from Wisconsin and said, help us out, and they said, well, I can give you 10 rounds of man. Now these boxes hold 40. And I'll burn through that in an hour of fighting and reenactment. So that's not a lot of ammunition. Um, actually, I think I went through 60 in about 45 minutes once, which is a lot, right? So they're getting 10 rounds, which won't last. Um, that's roughly three to four minutes of fighting, right? For three rounds a minute. So they get back into it a little bit. They manage to get more ammunition. They continue fighting throughout the day. The regiment's actually split up because as they're retreating, and you know, it's just turns into sort of a pell-mell mess. There's guys are running everywhere, and it's just, there's very little direction. The Confederates are rolling them up. Uh, one group of them uh, ends up one place, another group ends up somewhere else. But either way, everybody who fights beside them writes positive things about this <laughs> regiment that they, you know, they served with, um, uh, what was the uh, phrase? Conspicuous gallantry is 
is what the reports later said. Basically, I will take those boys in my red, my my brigade any time they serve with conspicuous gallantry. Uh, that's a bunch of guys who literally never fired their muskets before, <laughs> and they went, "Okay, I'll stand here by the bayonet, waiting for them to come." Um, so, pretty cool story. Uh, they also have a Medal of Honor winner uh, outside uh, during the Siege of Atlanta. Their uh, rifle pits are set up. They're kind of like foxholes, but Civil War foxholes. Um, and the 15th Michigan is told they need to take this batch of rifle pits, and they don't know if anybody's in those rifle pits, so they send the guy out to kind of <laughs> check and see. And he checks and sees, <laughs> signals that yes, there's guys there, jumps down, and manages to steal the flag of the 15th Texas, maybe? I think 15th Texas sounds right. Um, and to take a battle flag, which, eh, one of those, um, was a great honor for you and a tremendous dishonor for the man who you stole it from, or who did that whole regiment. So most of the time, the colonel who gets that flag is told, you know, or he says that you know, he'll defend that with his life. He doesn't. <laughs> yeah, so um, anytime you steal a flag, Instant medal of honor. That was just the term. So he does so, and eventually the medal of honor. There's some some discrepancy you find for like 25, 30 years after the war. There's guys saying he absolutely did it, and other guys from Company A with 15th Michigan going, No, he didn't. We did it. And eventually he got it, but there's some dis discrepancy as to whether he actually did it. Yes. All night. <laughs> well, it's a few acts of uniforms and other yes. textiles. So the word shoddy. shot came in there somewhere. Right? Yes. So um, buyers were selling junk to the government. Yes. So shoddy refers to, um, officially, it's the little bits of, it's actually also sometimes called stuff, um, little bits of scrap wool that end up just mixed in with the arms when they're making it. And it's kind of like, adding a little bit of flour to your meatloaf just to stretch it a little bit, kind of thing, right? Um, that's what we're doing. We're adding a little bit of extra junk in there, or shoddy, to the fabrics. Um, some fabrics you'll see have little speckles of different colors in them, and that's what that is. Um, and that begins to expand as a term because there are very unscrupulous contractors who are selling stuff to the government because you can make a quick buck, um, and it's really poor. There's uniforms that start blue and they got rained on and turn red. <laughs> not ideal, although there are red uniforms, so I guess it's not terrible. Um, there's cases of shoes falling apart after uh, putting a couple of miles on them. Um, when asked about it, the contractor said, well, of course they fell apart. They were meant for the cavalry. <laughs> Probably not true, but it's a really good line. I've heard it a lot. I'd really like to see the source it comes from, but I've heard it a lot. Um, yeah, so there's contractors that are very unscrupulous, and they've discovered you make a quick buck, and they're selling junk to the army just because they can. And so you've got guys with uh, uniforms that fall apart and change color and things like that. Now, the Confederate side has got their own ailments because not only do they have shoddy contractors, but they're working with just generally substandard stuff. Their uniforms are made out of what's called jean wool, which is a cotton wool blend instead of all wool. And um, the dyes they have access to are not very good. So most of the time when you see Confederates, we talk about Confederates wearing gray, right? Well, that's kind of beigey, kind of brownish, right? Most of the uniforms end up coming out roughly the color of your sweater there, um, because their dye is called logwood, which starts out kind of a nice blue gray, but fades very quickly in the sun to kind of a brownish color. <laughs> so they've got their own set of issues going on too. And you will see contractors on the union side trying to get away with that same switch over to using logwood instead of if you go back or again, the logwood's too wrong. Yeah, but that is the birth of the phrase shoddy. Were there any contractors that worked both sides? None that, none that I'm aware of. Um, I would be really surprised to find that there were none. It's just the nature of greedy business people, you know, being what it is. Um, I just have not heard of any, but it's the case though. Plus, you'd have to convince your whole workforce to actually support the Confederacy or the Union, which I feel like would be a hard 
to sell to, right? Because you're, you're making uniforms, for example, for the wrong guys. Did notice? I feel like, you know. Did they Michigan first? Did they march to Washington D.C. or did they take the train? I think they train. Because they got there in about a month, and that means mustered together, yeah. got everybody all formed up, and got there from Pontiac. It was, it wasn't the uh, staging area, uh, state fairgrounds? Yes. So, um, and actually, uh, also a Pontiac is Governor, uh, former Governor Wins uh, Wisner formed up the 22nd Michigan, and he's actually going to lead a regiment um, fairly briefly. He died in the uh, fairly quickly. Um, but he is also going to be, you know, that's awful when your, your colonel would be someone fairly significant in a community, at least fairly early on. It'd be governors, mayors, Lawyers, and people with some money and some class were educating people, um, and they were being your leaders. And so, if you look around, like I go home to Wisner House, he was forming up guys that are kind of property. And also, let's see here. Yes. Um, just like in the American Revolution, were there any particular traitors that, defect, that defected from the Union to the Confederacy? Yes, there were. Um, there were actually a number that went from the Confederacy to the Union also. Um, and I've, it was a while ago, and I don't have much more in the way of information for you than that, but I did read a number of cases where the Confederates would basically show up and go, I've changed my mind, can I join you guys? <laughs> um, and they'd have to swear an oath of allegiance, and they would be kind of put back into the, uh, into, well, not back into, but put into the uh, American forces. So, it does happen. Not wildly commonly, but it does happen. Alright, we've been here for about an hour and a half now. Just one, oop, mm, yeah, hour and a half now. Um, so, I'm going to say real quick if there's anyone who still wants to chat, I am willing. If there's anyone who is kind of feeling like it's bedtime, <laughs> it will not feel bad if a few of you start wandering toward the door. <laughs> By all means, stay chat if you like.